why don't we get started? Welcome everybody to Abode Academy 7 Session 2. I'm Mary Thorsby. I'm the CEO of Abode, and most of you know this is Abode. We are in our 10th year of caring for folks at the very end of life at absolutely no charge. We're a nonprofit, and folks can come to us for their final journey, and we'll love them up until they're ready to go. And we partner with every hospice in town to do that. Uh, I wanted to mention two things. One, Jeffrey was kind enough to, to suggest this. We had a wonderful art show the other weekend, and it's one of our fundraisers. We depend on donations and grants. So if you didn't make it to our art show, come to Abode next week, and I will sell you as much art as you would like to buy. We have some real beautiful pieces left, so please come. We have uh, Brother Cletus. We have Stephen Smith, uh, Terry Gay Puckett, and Gordon West, and they're, they're just gorgeous pieces. I also wanted to let you know that the recording from last week is on our website. So let me quickly show you how to find it. I'm gonna share my screen. This is our abode web, website, abodehome.org. And you just come here, you go under education. Let me take, let Cynthia in, oops. You come under education and click Abode Academy. Here's Abode Academy 7. You go there and scroll down a little bit and there's the first recording. So you can watch it right here. Um, the editor did not delete the first 15 minutes where we were just kind of waiting around. So you'll have to fast forward through that. She's gonna correct it and repost it. Um, but, but that's where we had Dementia, the Big Picture by Jenny Funk. And it was just wonderful, wasn't it? Yes, it was. Absolutely. Before I turn it over to Beverly to introduce Jeff, let's take a contemplative moment to just get comfortable, get focused, uh, get all of our trials and tribulations out of our, out of our brains and focus our brains on our, our special time tonight. So let's just take a few moments, um, take some deep breaths, get comfortable. Wonderful. I'd like to introduce our board president and voted San Antonio's best hospice nurse, Beverly Tumala. She is the chair of our education committee. Uh, Beverly, would you please introduce one of our very favorite speakers? Oh my gosh, our favorite people. Again, I just want to thank you all for coming. Um, you know, uh, last week I mentioned how important this subject is. And um, you know, in hospice, I see it every day, and I don't think there's a person that you meet that this disease hasn't touched. So I welcome all of you. I'm so happy you're here, and we are in for a big treat. One of our favorite people is with us tonight, um, Dr. Uh, Jeff Benzik. Um, you may recall, he did a wonderful presentation um, last year when we did our presentation on grief at Abode Academy 6. Tonight, um, we're happy to have Jeff back to talk about how dementia affects our brain. Jeff has been a psychiatrist in private practice since 2004. He's currently a consultant psychiatrist to the San Antonio Spurs. Um, he's a former United States Air Force flight surgeon, woo, and um, a psychiatrist and a graduate from Baylor College of Medicine and Texas A&M University. Jeff, Jeff is also a regular abode volunteer, inspired by the loss of his dear friend, Tom, who we were honored to care for back in 2022. So welcome, Jeff. I'm so glad you're here. And we just can't wait to hear what you've got to say tonight. Well, I couldn't couldn't be happier. And just, just a couple of plugs before my, I share my screen and I start on the slides. Um, if, if folks didn't catch Ginny's talk last week, it was great. And um, she did a nice plug of the Alzheimer's Association website. And it is 
incredible uh, in terms of its depth of information, its breadth of information yeah. uh, for caregivers. It's got scientific information. It's got just good practical yeah. stuff. So if you haven't given the uh, the Alzheimer's Association website a look, um, yeah, please do. And the other thing is, I'm just so happy to be here. When when Tom was able to spend his last couple of weeks, uh, you know, my former patient um, at Abode, I just said these are the kindest, sweetest people. I've ever come across, and I really wanted to be a part of this. So I, 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 I'm really happy to be here and able to, to talk with everybody. So um, I'm going to go fast because one of my favorite games is Stump the Psychiatrist. So um, I want to get through the slides, you know, relatively quickly. So there's plenty of time for the question and answer session later. Okay. So I'm going to share my screen here. Let's see. There's we want to share screen. Let's share, and let's put my slides up and let's go from the beginning okay can everybody see my slides yes okay can you see the slide yeah just is the whole is the slide on the whole screen no <laughs> we also see oh we see the next slide your agenda slides up on the top right okay so you're seeing that screen let's see here well, can... but we're seeing your first slide also yeah let's um you know what I'm going to do is just go to the PC screen only. Let's see if that works. So what are you guys seeing now? Do you see my first slide? Same thing. Same thing. Same thing. Okay. Is everybody okay with what they're seeing? Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Let's do that then. I'm going to go right back to where I was. Okay. So... There we go. All right. Um, Can you see through the lamp and everything? What's that? Why don't we all mute so that uh, any background noise is, is quiet? Okay. So, so the title of my talk is An Integrative Approach to Dementia. And um, uh, I guess to start off, I should remind everybody, so I'm a psychiatrist. I'm not a neurologist or a gerontologist, right? Um, Typically, if somebody is diagnosed with dementia, they're going to see um, either a neurologist or a gerontologist, right, for the actual treatment of that brain disease. Um, however, psychiatrists and neurologists are both licensed by the same board. And let's face it, a whole lot of stuff that's involved with dementia um, comes to my attention too, right? The mood changes, the behavior changes, the cognitive changes. So I see a whole lot of folks during their life who uh, may end up developing dementia, or as, as I was telling Wayne earlier, I see a lot of the um, after effects of dementia on the rest of the family. So, um, so this certainly touches my practice quite a bit. And I wanted to talk about the integrative approach. If you think about it, um, you know, years ago, we sort of used the term complementary. Um, and the whole idea behind complementary was that um, uh, I'm going to go see my doctor, my allopathic doctor or my osteopathic kind of standard medical care. Um, but then I might do this kind of off the wall stuff over here. And that's the complementary stuff. And that's how it was kind of looked at. And they were going to work in parallel. Right. But we now understand that there's things we can do that don't involve sort of standard medication that actually work that actually improve the situation. And so that's where that term integrative comes in. So that's kind of what I'm going to talk about today is, um, you know, I'll touch on the, 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 the sort of medical approaches to dementia. But again, you've got an expert coming in three weeks. If you saw the, um, the agenda for the, the, this whole series of talks, you've got an expert who's going to come and talk about the treatment, direct treatment of dementia and the future treatment. Of dementia. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so very exciting that that's going to happen. So um, I'll touch on those. But um, but uh, I'll save that for, for that presentation. And um, we're going to talk more about uh, really not only what you can do now, but more importantly, what we can do so you never get dementia, right? Because um, I don't want to get dementia is kind of a low bar, right? I think that's it's like going to a restaurant and them saying, well, we don't serve poison here. Well, you know, it's kind of obvious, right? Um, what we want to do is keep our brains as healthy as they can be for as long as we can. So let's go ahead and, and uh, we'll just jump through here. Uh, so we're going to uh, just a quick uh, introduction. What is dementia? We'll talk about the types of dementia. I'll add a little bit of the medical stuff to what uh, Ginny talked about. We'll talk about medical therapies. And then let's get into the really the integrative approaches to prevention and treatment. So very briefly in psychiatry, um, 
we have what's called major neurocognitive disorder. I don't know why we just don't call it dementia. Psychiatrists were a little we're a little weird that way. I think we like more syllables, right? Dementia is three syllables. Major neurocognitive disorder is nine, I think. So we just we just add a lot of syllables in there. But bottom line, a chronic decline in one or more cognitive domains, almost always involving memory, and it has to be enough to affect your daily life, of course. Um, and etiology is a fancy word for cause. What causes dementia? Pretty much anything, right? If it can affect the brain, it can affect, uh, it can cause dementia. And um, Alzheimer's disease, as we touched on last time, is the most common cause of dementia. So I'm not going to bore you with a lot of statistics. Um, if you can see my slide, you can see that the brain changes in Alzheimer's, just a few numbers. Um, we'll start up to 20 years before an actual Alzheimer's diagnosis. And I'll say that again, you can see brain changes 20 years before somebody actually has Alzheimer's. We know that if you, um, if during the pandemic, if you had Alzheimer's or dementia, you are more likely to die from COVID. And you might think, well, obviously that's because um, they were in a assisted living facility and they were all crowded together. That actually isn't why. It very likely has something to do with the inflammatory changes that occur in the brain during Alzheimer's. And the fact that COVID, as we know, is way more than just a pulmonary disease. It is a full body inflammatory condition. Um, Jenny touched on how much, uh, how much money uh, our caregivers save our country, right? 11 million Americans provide unpaid care to family, family or friends at a, um, at a um, savings of $340 billion to our country. And two thirds of caregivers are women, 40% have college degrees. So again, I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time here. Let's, let's go ahead and move on. We talked about the types of dementia. Um, just really quickly, um, if, if, if somebody says, oh, my family member has dementia and you say, oh, what do they have Alzheimer's? You're gonna be right 60 to 80% of the time. Again, Alzheimer's has a gradual onset. It tends to be very slow and progressive. Um, roughly, um, from the time somebody gets an Alzheimer's diagnosis, typical length of life is between four to eight years. Now, again, we, we've all know somebody who's had Alzheimer's for 15, 20 years, but in general, once you've had an Alzheimer's um, diagnosis, um, prognosis is, is, is for about four to eight years. Vascular dementia is the second most common type, somewhere between 10 to 20%. Um, as, as the name would suggest, vascular dementia means there's something going on with the um, the vascular system, right? Those little garden hoses that transport blood around our body. As those clot off, you can you you literally have little parts of the brain that are dying. And so what you're going to see is a stepwise progression, right? Somebody's stable, and then they take a downturn. Then they're stable for a while, then they take another downturn. That's typically the progression of vascular dementia. Lewy body dementia is probably more prevalent than the slide says at 5%. Um, it's commonly associated with Parkinson's disease. Um, it has a very interesting presentation that uh, folks often present with psychotic symptoms, hallucinations, delusions, paranoia. So they might show up to, to me in the psychiatrist's office. Um, and as I mentioned, it's, it's associated with Parkinson's disease a great deal. Um, frustratingly, it actually gets worse often when you use antipsychotic medication. Right, so it's actually a real challenge, um, both for the obviously the person suffering from it, but also from the caregiver. Um, uh, Ten percent of dementias are mixed, right? So people can have more more than one kind of dementia. Just because somebody has dementia doesn't mean they just have one kind. Um, and then I, I wanted to also mention I'm going to skip the hippocampal sclerosis in the interest of time. It's a very rare form of dementia, but frontotemporal dementia. Um, um, somebody had a wonderful question last week about what's the youngest age you can see dementia. Um, remember, you can see dementia in the teens if somebody has one of the causes of dementia, right? A brain illness, a, a trauma to the head, that sort of thing. But you can look demented. Frontotemporal dementia, 60 to 80% of them present in their 40s. So again, uh, changes in behavior, maybe even depression, um, just an odd presentation when they come to a psychiatrist's office, we have to think about these kinds of, of brain illnesses and we have to make sure we're not missing something. So I'm gonna move on. I'm gonna come back to the modifiable risk factors in a bit. I wanted to talk very briefly about the non-modifiable risk factors. Um, the reality is age. You know, you, you can't do anything about your age. 
you know, it's it just a non-modifiable risk factor. But um, your risk of dementia doubles every five years after 65, right? So just remember that um, dementia, while as you age, there's a higher risk, dementia is not normal aging, right? We're all going to have some what's called benign senescence. You know, I'm 53. My brain, my my brain, my my memory is not as good as it was in my 20s and 30s, but um, but obviously that's not dementia. So if someone um has some of the uh, the symptoms of dementia, that is not considered normal aging. I want to touch briefly on family history and genetics, and I'm talking about them separately. Believe it or not, if you have a family history of say Alzheimer's, it does increase your risk of having it um in your future but that is actually different than your genes, okay? And what I mean by that is we know that there are about 30 genes that are associated with Alzheimer's. The APOE gene is the one that seems to be the most strongly correlated. Um, the APOE gene codes for a protein that carries cholesterol. It's apolipoprotein, lipo means fat. Um, uh, so cholesterol, the protein means protein. Um, there are three different variations of the APOE gene, E2, E3, E4. And depending on which of those you got from your parents, you might be at higher risk of developing dementia. But I just want to reassure you, um, it's not uncommon. People will say, Dr. Benzik, um, I did 23andMe. And they said, I'm going to have a higher risk of dementia because I have the APOE, whatever, E4 variation. And I just have to reassure them, just because you have some of the genes doesn't mean you're going to get something, right? It just means you have a propensity toward it. So that's why we're going to come back to the modifiable risk factors later and talk about what you can do to prevent getting this stuff. Okay, um, moving on. So gender, uh, females are more likely to develop dementia. And somebody asked last, um, last time about a head injury, and we had a great discussion about head injury. Head injury absolutely is a, is a um, um, non-modifiable risk factor for dementia. Once you have it, it's not modifiable. Um, and clearly, there's a risk between the severity of the head injury and the risk for dementia. So again, um, protect those noggins. You know, um, you know, uh, folks in sports have to be certain, certainly extra careful with those sorts of things. So, you know, I'm going to move on. We're going to talk more about Alzheimer's because it's the most common type. Just very briefly, I wanted to sort of explain what the neuropathology of Alzheimer's is. Alzheimer's involves changes both within the neurons. So a neuron is the main cell type in your brain. Nerves talk to each other, that's how your brain works. Um, so what happens is in between the neurons, so when the nerves try to talk to each other, you get accumulation of something called beta amyloid, right? That's a protein that occurs um, in between the cells of your brain. And as this accumulates, your nerves can't talk to each other properly, you can't communicate. Within the protons, you get something, uh, excuse me, within the neurons, you get twisted strands of something called tau protein, and that forms tangles. And they occur along the little pathways where, for example, uh, nutrients are transported or oxygen is transported. So as this builds up within your cells, those cells die, okay? Um, and that's called a plaque. And the more plaques you get, number one, you can see them on scans, and number two, obviously your brain forms a scar right? When your cells die, right? Think about if you get a cut on your skin, right? What's going to happen? As, as, as the, those cells die and your brain is healing, there's going to be a, or as the cells are, or, or the skin is healing, there's going to be a scar and actual shrinkage of the tissue. So what happens is, as these plaques form, your brain actually begins to shrink. Um, and then of course, your body's trying to clear the, the, the dead cells, but your immune system can't keep up with it. There are something called microglial cells that can't keep up with that damage. And so you just get more and more inflammation in the brain, which over time is obviously very, very dangerous for it. So, so again, in Alzheimer's, you get death within the cell and you get death between the cells. And that's important for the actual potential treatments of Alzheimer's. So again, not gonna spend a lot of time on this. Jenny talked about the signs of Alzheimer's last week. Almost always in Alzheimer's, you're gonna have memory disruption, um, it, it has to disrupt daily life. You know, again, the benign senescence isn't so much of a problem, but when you forget to say, um, use the coffee maker that you've used for 40 years, when you forget how to drive to the, um, the HEB that you always used to go to, um, that, uh, that actually is somewhat life-changing. Um, so you see difficulty completing, uh, familiar tasks, 
trouble with spatial relationships, visual images, so driving becomes an issue, misplacing things and losing the ability to retrace your steps. Um, so I don't know about you guys, but if I don't put my keys and my wallet and my phone in the same little dish when I get home from work every day, they're gone, right? So what if you did that every day for 40 years and suddenly you stop doing that and you can't find your wallet or your keys or your phone and you genuinely begin to think that somebody broke into your house, so you call the police, right? If you don't know where your keys, wallet, and phone are, you might become uh, very paranoid, right? And so paranoia, unfortunately, is a not uncommon sign of Alzheimer's disease, and police departments are pretty used to this, this kind of thing. Um, decreased or poor judgment. Um, so fire departments also have to be used to this sort of thing. People will wander away from the stove when they're cooking something. Withdrawal from formerly uh, enjoyed activities, and again, any kind of change in mood, personality, or behavior can be a sign of Alzheimer's. Um, okay, so I'm concerned I have Alzheimer's. So what do I do? Well, uh, a takeaway point from this talk is that 10% of dementias are completely reversible, right? So you want to make sure that your doctor is pursuing why you're having dementing symptoms in case we can completely reverse it. And as you see there, there are some um, very identifiable non-degenerative causes. So depression, right? There is a syndrome called pseudo-dementia. You know, I think in general, when we talk about depression, and we could have a whole talk about depression at some point, um, people forget about the cognitive aspects of it. You know, we think about the low energy and I can't sleep and uh, I don't have any sex drive anymore and, and I don't want to do anything. But people forget that when you're depressed, you really can't think very well. And folks can be so depressed that they can look demented. And obviously that is extraordinarily treatable um, with antidepressants and certainly some, um, some other interventions. So depression's gotta be ruled out. Sleep apnea. So the frontal lobe of your brain, which is where dementia starts, right? Where Alzheimer's starts in the very front of your brain, that frontal part of your brain is exquisitely sensitive to not getting enough oxygen. So, um, when people will often come to my office and say, Dr. Benzik, I've developed ADD. And I think you're 53. You probably didn't just develop ADD. And they'll say, yeah, but I can't remember anything. And I'm losing things and this and that. And I do a good sleep history. And it turns out they have sleep apnea. Again, that's a reversible cause of memory decline. Um, delirium is a medical emergency. And that can be all, all from all kinds of brain infections, um, you know, tumors, things like that. So we want to make sure they're not in a delirious state where they have waxing and waning levels of consciousness. A whole bunch of medications can lead to dementing-like syndromes, right? And we can even come back to that in the question and answer um, session. Um, I warn people who have used, for example, Benadryl for years and years and years to sleep. The evidence that Benadryl can lead to a dementia-like state is actually better than the evidence for things like Xanax and Valium, right? So antihistamines taken long-term, um, specifically the sedating antihistamines, you have to, to see if that's contributing to something. A lot of brain infections, thyroid dysfunction, um, that gets overlooked quite a bit, but a low thyroid can look like dementia. And obviously, uh, you know, vitamin deficiencies, things like that, nutritional deficiencies, and of course, alcohol. There's nothing good, sorry, but nothing good comes from alcohol. Sorry, everybody. Um, so what's the workup I need to get? Well, according to the Alzheimer's Association, um, the doctor needs to do a good medical history and a physical exam. And, and that would be kind of obvious. Again, that's kind of the low bar. But when you're getting the workup for dementia, you want someone to put their hands on you, right? You want them to test your strength. You want them to, you know, follow my finger or my light with your eyes. So they're testing your cranial nerves in your brain. You want them to dust off the reflex hammer. And, 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 and pound on your knees and such. We want to do a good neurologic exam on you. Typically, there'll be a lot of lab work, right? Again, we want to make sure that you're not deficient in, I don't know, thiamine, right? Somebody who's deficient in thiamine, a B vitamin, can look, frankly, demented, and it's completely reversible. So you'd hate to miss anemias or, or infections or things like that. So cognitive and neuropsychological testing, and, and Wayne, I appreciated earlier when you mentioned the neuropsychological testing. So there's there's really three ways you can sort of do cognitive testing. One is just asking people some obvious questions. What's the day today? Where are we? Um, start at 100 and count backwards by sevens. Um, 
you know, raise your hand, turn your head and open your mouth, three-step commands. So there's some, there's some standardized questions that physicians and, and um, nurse practitioners and PAs learn in medical, learn in school, um, to where we have a pretty good idea of the questions that'll give you a sort of a screening for memory issues or dementia. A step above that are the, um, the tests that sometimes doctors will do right in the office. They maybe have it on an iPad. And they'll have you do some tasks on an iPad, might take 15, 20 minutes. And those can also be very helpful in determining if there's some significant medical um, or, or, or um, memory problems. Um, the gold standard is neuropsychological testing. Neuropsychological testing is a six to eight hour battery of tests administered by a neuropsychologist, which is a trained mental health professional who you'll sit down with, they'll take your history, what are you worried about, what are your concerns, and they'll come up with, uh, again, it's six to eight hours of different tests. Sometimes it's on a computer, sometimes they have you arrange these little cubes in different ways, sometimes it's paper and pencil, but, um, but it's fascinating. And neuropsychological testing can in great detail determine what parts of the brain are not working properly. Not just the regions of the brain, but things like your processing speed, your IQ, your verbal memory, your working memory. Um, if I have concerns about somebody, maybe they have a strong family history, maybe they're just showed, uh, starting to show some signs, I will recommend they get neuropsychological testing because then you have a baseline, right? Let's say I'm in my mid 60s but hey, everybody in my family had dementia. Well, it would be a good idea to have a solid baseline. Um, that way in three years, we can retest you. In five years, we can retest you and we'll have something to compare it to. Um, so that's neuro neuropsychological testing. Um, brain imaging can be very helpful. Not as helpful as you would think. Um, again, brain imaging almost always shows structural stuff, not necessarily functional stuff, depending on the type of testing you get. Um, and of course, that, that technology is getting better and better all the time. And then, like I mentioned, you just want to do a good screen for depression. You want to make sure the individual um, can still enjoy things. You want to make sure that they're, um, uh, again, they look forward to stuff, um, that they're not thinking about death or suicide or obvious things like that. Um, so now let's shift gears a bit. Let's talk just very briefly. Like I said, I'm at 20 minutes. Perfect. I want to be done by about 40 minutes. So we have plenty of time for questions. So most of the time when people present with early onset type, um, let's say Alzheimer's, they're going to start with, as you can see the slide there, a cholinesterase inhibitor and possibly memantine. Okay, so cholinesterase inhibitors, um, uh, anytime in science you see a word that ends in A-S-E, it usually means an enzyme. Um, in this case, cholinesterase um, uh, uh Cholinesterase is an enzyme that breaks down acetylcholine. Now, remember when I said those neurons in the front of your lobe will die in Alzheimer's disease? One of the main products that they, that they use to communicate with each other is acetylcholine, right? Cholinesterase breaks down acetylcholine. So a cholinase in, inhibitor would stop the breakdown, would, would inhibit the thing that breaks down acetylcholine. So cholinesterase inhibitors, to summarize, help your brain have more acetylcholine so that it can work better even in that early Alzheimer's. I'm going to skip down to memantine, which is on the slide. Um, uh, glutamate is your primary excitatory neurotransmitter in your brain. It is the main chemical that your brain uses, or excuse me, that your nerves use to talk to each other. But if you have too much, your brain gets excited and cells can die. Memantine regulates that. It helps you have the right amount of glutamate in your brain. Both um, the cholinesterase inhibitors and memantine are generic. They've been around a long time. They are typically very well tolerated. Again, as we learned last week, nothing reverses dementia, but we can slow it down, right? And remember that four to eight year time period I mentioned earlier. If I can keep somebody, for example, out of assisted living for even a few months of that four to eight year period, uh, 48 year period, we've saved thousands of dollars, we've saved stress, we've saved um, you know the dilemmas. So so absolutely very reasonable to use those medications, the cholinesterase inhibitors and memantine in somebody with early Alzheimer's. I mentioned lecanemab on there, and and Ginny mentioned this last week. Lecanemab is a breakthrough in immunotherapy. It is actual antibodies against those amyloid plaques in your brain, right? 
sounds amazing, right? If we can mark those amyloid plaques early, your immune system can clear them, right? Unfortunately, even though this is FDA approved, as Jenny mentioned, it is extraordinarily expensive. It requires lots of expensive follow-up testing with MRIs, um, and um, it can make things worse. It actually has been shown to promote brain shrinkage. So most of the European medical societies have said, hey, this, that we, it's just not something we're going to, we're going to use. The FDA did approve it. However, um, if you're going to get it, I think you pretty much always have to be in a research study now. So again, amazing for the future. And you're going to learn about this more in a future talk in the series, but, um, but just know that that's out there. Now, I did want to mention a very recently uh, approved medication for the treatment in agitation in Alzheimer's. So brexipiprazole is an antipsychotic medication. Okay, so I've been using it for years and we've been using it for years for schizophrenia uh, and believe it or not, in low doses for, for depression, it can actually help augment antidepressants. Um, but it got an FDA approval recently for agitation in Alzheimer's disease. So both the, uh, the physically agitated, the irritable, the angry, the acting out, the punching, the kicking, right? And the sort of, um, cognitively agitated, right? We, we've all know somebody with, with Alzheimer's who just keeps asking the same question over and over in that very anxious, that really scared way. And we just didn't have good treatments. So I have four patients now on brexipiprazole. The brand name is Rexulti, by the way. But I have four patients taking this for agitation and Alzheimer's disease. And I'm very impressed. And I don't say that a lot when it comes to antipsychotic medications. A, a premise of my practice is to use those as absolutely little as possible. But I'll tell you, I'm pretty impressed so far with the four patients I have on it. Both the family members and the caregivers um, laud, laud me, you know, you know, yay for me, but the medicine did all the work, right? Um, but they really appreciate that we're using the Rexulti. So if you know someone, uh, a friend or a family member uh, dealing with agitation and Alzheimer's, worth at least mentioning to the doc, hey, would this be something that can be considered? Okay, doing good on time. So if you think about it, we want to prevent anybody from get, getting Alzheimer's because like I said, our actual treatments are somewhat limited. And that's where this integrative approach comes in, right? So kind of outside of the realm of just thinking about medication. So a um, couple of important points on the right side of the slide. So the Lancet Commission in Great Britain suggested in 2020 that if you re remove modifiable risk factors, you can prevent or delay 40% of dementia cases, right? That is an outrageous number. But then it, then two years later, the US, you know, the American Centers for Disease Control did another study showing that again, 37% of dementias in the US are linked to these eight modifiable risk factors, right? And to get even more detailed, if, if, uh, if you are over 45, okay, and you have none of these risk factors, right, um, there is only a 3 to 4% chance that as you age, you will report something called subject subjective cognitive decline. And I don't remember the exact definition of that, but subjective cognitive decline is actually a pretty good harbinger of who's going to go on to get Alzheimer's, right? So again, if you have none of these risk factors over 45, your risk of going to that place is three to 4%. If you have four or more of these risk factors, your risk of going to Alzheimer's is about 25%, right? So it is very important that we get aggressive in addressing these um, risk factors. And so just very briefly, I'll go down one by one, cardiovascular health, hypertension, um, blood pressure, right? Um, I treat a lot of attention deficit disorder. I use a lot of stimulants with patients, Adderall, Ritalin, things like that. So I am a crusader for blood pressure. And I tell folks 120 over 80 is your target. Um, in this study from the CDC, even if you were pre-hypertensive, that is um, 130 to 139-ish over like 90-ish, yeah, that still counted as the risk factor. Right, so 120 over 80 really should be our target for blood pressure. Second one on there, not meeting the aerobic physical activity guidelines. Well, what does that mean? So in that study, it was 150 minutes of zone two 
cardio exercise per week. Okay, Dr. Benzik, what is 150 minutes of zone two um, exercise? Zone two cardio is that you're huffing and puffing enough to where it's hard to hold a conversation, right? You know, if you're walking with somebody and you're huffing and puffing and, and they ask a question, you can, yeah, you know, the other day we did this and then we did this. So you can't just hold a normal conversation. That's zone two cardio. So we want everybody huffing and puffing, right? For about three and a half hours a week, okay? Oh, obesity, we know that's just because of the, probably because of the inflammation more than anything else is a risk factor. Diabetes, of course, is, you know, terrible for our nervous system, our, our cardiovascular system. There's depression. How about that? On par with obesity, diabetes, and hypertension, right? So depression has to be aggressively managed and better in depression is not good enough, right? We want, you know, better is not good enough. The goal is well. So I want people to tell me, Dr. Benzik, I'm not depressed anymore. That is the goal with the treatment of depression. Um, obviously, cigarette smoking, I think we all know it's not, not good for you. Hearing loss isn't that fascinating. Your brain needs stimulation. It will not function well without stimulation, okay? So hearing loss, and, and I get it. I, I see my poor patients and family members fumbling with those hearing aids, but keep them in right? Because not having them in, again, is the, a risk factor for developing dementia. And then pretty obvious, please don't binge drink. You know, it's just, you know, it's just terrible for your brain. Okay. We're doing good on time. We've got about 10 minutes left. Now, earlier I said, remember, avoiding dementia, pretty low bar, right? How about this? Um, executive functioning is basically what you need your brain to do. Your executive functioning makes you, you. Somebody had a great question about that last week, and I don't think we ever addressed it. Um, the What is executive functioning? Well, think about if you were a company executive, the things that you have to do, right? I have to organize and plan and multitask and regulate my emotions and set priorities and, um, and plan stuff and uh, determine what's reality and what's not. These are your executive functionings. So, if my executive function is here and I start to get a dementia disorder and I lose 20% of that, maybe I'm not so healthy. But if my executive function starts out up here and I lose 20%, hey, I'm still living at home, right? So we all need to be optimizing our brain functioning. And so just some tips that I added here that I hope folks will, will incorporate into your life. Um, um, I, I know there's a temptation when you can't remember something, or if you have a question, um, just to pull out your phone and Google it real quick, right? Give yourself a chance to remember something. If you know that information is in there, give yourself a minute or two to see if you can pull it up, right? You really are stimulating neurons that way. Um, occasionally, I will do that to myself. I'll say, hey, who was that point guard for the Utah Jazz back in 1988? And he played with Carl Malone, the mailman. What was that guy's name? It's John Stockton, by the way. But but um, but I will occasionally do something like that just to keep my brain active. Try to remember old movies or 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 actors or things like that. It's actually a, a lot of fun to do. Um, but uh, along the same line, brain games and puzzles, learning a new language, right? Keeping the brain stimulated. The apps, Babel, whatever, they're fantastic. Um, taking a class, learning a new skill. Um, you know, whatever, take a class in home electrical stuff. If you're, if you can do that, how to crochet, I don't know, just do something new. I will, I will commonly ask people, when was the first time, excuse me, when was the last time you did something for the first time? And folks will say, well, I don't know. So I think it's always a good idea to be trying kind of new stuff. Keep that brain stimulated, learning a new musical instrument behind me. Um, I bought a drum set a few months, months ago. I don't know how to play drums, but Hey, I'm in my 50s. I figured it'd be a good idea. Keep the brain stimulated. Let's do something new. So um, enhancing your social connections, you can see on the slide, there is a loneliness epidemic in our country. And loneliness is absolutely a risk factor for heart disease, diabetes, cancer, all kinds of stuff. So keeping connected with friends and family, um, like it says, they're engaging in conversations and volunteering. And I happen to know of a place that always needs volunteers, right? So um, volunteering is a wonderful way to, to keep the brain active. Now, for our country Western fans, who's that guy? Anybody know? Oh, we have no country Western fans. It's it. 
Um, it's Johnny Paycheck, right? Does anybody remember what Johnny Paycheck used to tell us to say to our bosses in his famous song? Take this job and shove it. There you go. Very impressive. <laughs> yes. So Johnny Paycheck, you know, and he was, you know, for the working man. He wanted us to go into our tell our boss and say, take this job and shove it. And I want to do that all the time. And I'm self-employed. But anyway, um, but um, the reality is the longer you work, the less likely you are to develop dementia. Right. And I found that study in 2015, which clearly showed. Yeah. So quitting work early, actually, the earlier you retire, the more likely you are to develop a dementing process. Right. It doesn't if you don't like your job, if you're ready to retire, if you reach the age, of course you can retire, but don't stop doing something. Right. We just got to keep that brain active. Again, volunteer at church, get a part time job, you know, be the Walmart greeter. Doesn't matter. Just just keep your brain active for as long as you can. Yeah. All right. Now, uh, again, in our last five minutes, uh, let's talk about some when people think of integrative, they think of herbs and that sort of thing and, and, and supplements. So I'm going to go over a few. Um, for depression, um, I have plenty of patients with mild to moderate depression on things like saffron, right? There are 17 controlled trials using saffron for depression um, since 2004, both with, uh, both with antidepressants and also on its own. So um, the data is good. And I have some patients who haven't responded to anything else who can take saffron and get benefit. We've all heard of curcumin and turmeric, right, for inflammation, but guess what? There's plenty of data in depression. And most folks have heard of St. John's wort. St. John's wort um, can uh, can have some of the same properties as Prozac, uh, Paxil, Zoloft, um, Effexor, right, in it, how they work on serotonin. Now, obviously, before you start anything like this, you want to clear it with your doctor. But um, just to let folks know, there's good data on this stuff. And I've only learned about this in the last few years of practice, and I I, I get uh, again very frustrated with our medical education, uh, and I think the um, little opinion here, but the influence of the pharmaceutical uh, industry, right? We want to right jump right to medication sometimes, and we forget that there's some natural stuff that, you know, the Creator put on Earth that actually can help quite a bit. So, what are some integrative options for my brain for cognitive enhancement? Okay, and again. Disclaimer, before you look at any of these, right, you want to clear it with your doc, but I just wanted to put a few um, a few supplements up there. Um, many of my patients with attention deficit disorder take alpha-GPC, right? Alpha-GPC can enhance the acetylcholine production that we talked about. Um, so some folks can take alpha-GPC and get a few hours of improved focus, concentration, sustained attention. Um, I don't recommend it for people with any kind of cardiovascular disease. Um, because it can be a little stimulating, but um, but it is pretty cool and the data is solid. Um, there is some evidence that sage, yeah, the stuff that might be outgrowing in your raised bed, can improve cognition. Um, only one study and it needs replication, but I did want to put it up there just because it is interesting that hey, there's you know these herbals that actually have been shown to have some benefit. People will ask me, uh, so Dr. Benzik, what do you take and what do you recommend for your family? And the first thing I recommend is this one, the Bacopa, right? I actually, um, I, I was I was uh, validated here recently. I have a patient with uh, Parkinson's disease and she had seen her neurologist and he did the same thing. He had her starting to take Bacopa. It is in Ayurvedic medicine, right? Indian medicine is the most important component you, or the most important thing used for cognitive enhancement. And uh, what sold me was that in eight of nine placebo controlled trials, it did enhance memory. Right, and it it, do, it does so likely by enhancing acetylcholine release. Although again, nobody's 100% sure about that, but it's really well tolerated. Um, it's cheap, right? Don't spend a lot of money on supplements. We can talk about that in a bit during Q and A, but you don't have to spend a lot of money on supplements, folks. Um, but Bacopa is cheap, and in, in a lot of folks, it um, it uh, it can be very beneficial. So uh, rhodiola, same thing. There's good evidence. It can help with memory, depression, complex task performance. I remind people if you're going to take rhodiola, again, clear that with your doc. It can have some interactions with certain medica medications that are metabolized in your liver. But, um, but it is neat stuff. And I do have some patients taking it for, like I said, depression and uh, to improve their, their, their memory or their, their cognitive uh, performance. Um, 
ginseng, and before I move at all uh, beyond uh, just the name ginseng, just uh, again, a disclaimer, if you're taking anything that starts with a gin, right, ginkgo, ginseng, um, ginger, right, um, be aware that is there is some bleeding risk, okay, that it, it, they can enhance bleeding, so just be aware of that. Um, but in multiple studies, and I saw this across multiple um, resources, um, ginseng can improve working memory. Um, most of those studies, it was American ginseng, but there's some data for the Korean ginseng also. These ginsenicides do appear to have some um, ability to slow amyloid proteins. Um, so uh, that's ginseng. And then uh, kana, um, interestingly, it way more veterinary data than human data, which I thought was kind of fun. How do you how do you test for dementia in your dog? I don't know, um, but um, but there is some data that it can it can have some anti-inflammatory and antidepressant benefit. Pretty neat stuff actually. All right, so we're right where I wanted to finish up. So I'm going to close just with um, people always ask me, how do I know where to get supplements? What's a good place to get them? And I'm not going to sell off on, I'm not going to just, you know, say that one is any better than the other. I do like Swanson that I mentioned here on the slide. Swanson, American company, very inexpensive, always having sales on their website. Um, and a friend of mine went on, uh, does mission trips and Swanson always provides the supplements. And I thought that was pretty cool. But anyway, if you're going to get supplements, you want to look somewhere on the website for this symbol. That's the National Sanitation Foundation. It means that that lab voluntarily has their facilities inspected for cleanliness and quality and things like that. Okay, just so look for that somewhere on a website if you want to get some uh, some supplements. I know Amazon got in a lot of trouble a few years ago because they were selling supplements that weren't of the best quality. So, um, so okay. Um, that's, that's really all I had. I'm going to, I guess, unshare my, uh, my screen here and, uh, maybe we can open it up for some Q and A. That was great. Thank you, Jeff. Sure. Yes. Goodness. Well, let's see here. So on the gin, gin and tonic, that also would be not a good one. Yeah. We try to limit those. Yeah. <laughs> yeah but you won't get malaria. If you drink your gin and tonic. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, let's okay. see. Aspen is asking what dosage of bacopa. Baca uh, I, I knew you were going to ask me that. And I apologize. I can't remember. But I know with the Swanson one, you can just follow the instructions on the bottle. Um, because, um, yeah, they and the, the 10 to 1 ratio, yeah, I know is on there. Um, and yeah, just to follow the instructions on the bottle, I remember looking that up in my textbook of integrative medicine, and I said, aha, here's here's one we can take. Yeah. Um, I would love to answer the question on Seroquel. So okay. thank you, Andy, for asking that question. So Seroquel or quetiapine is an antipsychotic medication, right? It is very sedating. It has some wonderful anti-anxiety properties, right? It can help with psychosis. Um but it is not FDA approved for that. Um, like we mentioned in Lewy body dementia, antipsychotics can make things worse. So you you just have to be very careful. There, um, if it's Lewy bodies associated with Parkinson's disease, there is a new medication, and I apologize, I just can't remember the name of it because typically neurologists have to prescribe it. But there is a specific medication for psychotic symptoms in Parkinson's. Um, and so I typically recommend going for that before I would, if you can avoid it, before um, uh, using an antipsychotic in Lewy body dementia. Now, that being said, you know, with some of these patients, folks, we just do what we got to do, right? I mean, I've got a couple of patients with Parkinson's and psychotic illnesses, and the antipsychotics make the Parkinson's worse. They just do. They block dopamine. But oh my gosh, these people's quality of life is just so rotten that we just sometimes do what we have to do. And then, and I'll do it and coordinate with the neurologist. The neurologist will say, they'll tell me, hey doc, do what you got to do for the psychosis because if we don't get that under control, I, you know, I'm not going to have any kind of quality of life. Mm -hmm. um, and then specific diet. So another great question. Um, uh, uh, if you know who Michael Pollan is, he wrote a wonderful book called The Omnivore's Dilemma. And he has this wonderful seven word phrase for how to eat healthy. And it's really simple. It's 
eat food, not too much, mostly plants, right? So eat food, right? Real food, whole foods, right? If I look at the ingredients in an apple, it's going to say apple, right? If I look at the ingredients in breakfast cereal, gosh, it's, it's this long, right? So eat, eat real food, whole foods, not too much, right? We can all eat probably less than we think. My, um, a lot of churches do a 21-day fast in January. And so a couple of years ago, I gave up eating sun up to sundown for the 21 days. And my stepdaughter asked me, hey, what'd you learn? And I said, I need to eat a lot less than I think I do, right? So eat food, not too much, and mostly plants. Not saying you can't enjoy meat, but, um, but mostly we all should have a plant-based diet. If you're looking for something even more specific, I would recommend um, the DASH diet. If you've not heard of the DASH diet, it was designed to reduce blood pressure and blood sugar. Um, it is, it's like a Mediterranean diet. And if you just Google uh, DASH diet for beginners, you'll find a hundred books and they're not really thick or anything, um, but they're cookbooks. Um, the DASH diet is the only, only diet that's actually been shown in good studies to reduce depression, right? How cool is that? Right. So again, you get your healthy fats in your olive oil, your avocados, your, your nuts, things like that. Um, and there's evidence that can actually reduce depression. Um, and so what do you recommend to use as a sleep aid in lieu of Seroquel? Again, again, from Sandy. So um, uh, there's a lot of other things you could at least try. Again, we try to stay away from anticholinergics or antihistamines like the sedating ones like Benadryl. Um, if insurance will swing it, um, um, Balsamra, right? Because Balsamra, and there's two other cousins of it, Davigo and Qvivic, they're not habit forming. Um, they don't have the cognitive dangers that a Xanax or an Ambien uh, or a Lunesta would. Um, they, if people don't drive their cars into telephone poles in the morning when they wake up from them. Um, but the hardest part about those is they're new. And so sometimes you have to have failed some, um, some of the other sleep medications first. But where I can get my patients on Belsomra, occasionally, actually, I, I, sometimes they'll cover something called Remelteon first. Remelteon or Rosarum hits melatonin receptors. Um, and it's okay. It's, it's very safe. And insurance is yeah, plus or minus with it. But, but if you can get Belsomra, yeah, that would be helpful. Um, and yes, I agree with you, Aspen. He did say, eat what your grandmother would recognize as food, right? You know, she would say the oatmeal um, is uh, is definitely a whole food. <laughs> okay, other questions? And I'm going to put in the name of that in the chat. I'm going to put Belsamra, uh, De Vigo, or Qvivic, which is spelled really funny. Jeff, we have a question. Is the familial... familial risk the same for Alzheimer's as it is for vascular dementia? What a great question. And I don't know the answer. Um, I would think not, believe it or not, just because vascular, as we know, so much of that is lifestyle related, right? So I know, um, you know, one of the things my dad used to tell me, right, before he passed away was um, he used to talk about how his, his parents used to eat Right. And we have a strong family history of heart disease, but he also would tell me, you know, hey, Jeff, they were not eating very healthy at all. Right. And so, and he always ate really healthy. And, and I think I, I like to think he instilled that in me. Um, you know, and, and now my kids eat pretty healthy. Um, so um I, I genuinely believe that, yeah, so much of that is related to diet. I would think it would be a little less, but that is, I'm totally speculating on that. Um, and then how to get existing dementia patients to become more cooperative compliant. Okay, that's really hard, <laughs> right? Um, we'll just start with that. That's just really hard. And Wayne asked me a wonderful question earlier about what's what's been the most difficult challenge that I've seen in working either with someone with dementia or their families. And it is the sadness that I mentioned, if, if y'all weren't listening to that. It is just how hard it is to, to do this. So um, uh, sometimes you, you just do the best you can. And I, I know that's kind of a, a, a weenie answer, but but I, really you just kind of do the best you can. Um, I know some families um, who have gotten their family members while they're still cogent to sign things like, when I am 80, I will turn over my keys, 
right? And then they have to sign it with their own signature. And that way, when they turn 80, it's, dad, look, you signed this, um, that sort of thing. Um, but uh, yeah, other than I, I'm, I'm so not an expert on the behavioral parts of things. I don't know what I could tell you. I do remember, for example, uh, wandering. There are ways that you can you can keep folks from wandering. Um, you can take if 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 they're if they're a male, you can go to Home Depot and buy a ladies' room sign, and put it on the front inside of the front door, right? Because it's so ingrained for men not to go into a ladies' room that you have to use whatever you can. Um, yeah. You know, use use force of habit with what they can remember from when they were cogent, but you can you can stop wandering that way. Yeah. And then uh, great question, certain brain or puzzle game games. Um, I wish I could. I know that there are apps for that, that you can put on iPads and that sort of thing. Um, and then, um, uh, but whatever they like, you know, uh, uh, people like crossword puzzles. Crossword puzzles are great, right? I mean, how many times have we all done a crossword puzzle and say, you know, a five letter word for, I don't know, beverage. I don't know. And then you leave and you come back an hour later and you go, oh, you put the answer in. That's those are those neurons stimulating. Right. So I really like crossword puzzles for people. Um, and Natalie has a great question about stress can be a risk factor. Yes, I have a great answer for that. So um, there are these amazing studies where scientists took um, uh, healthy subjects. It usually means college students. Right. And they, they drew their blood and they looked at their markers of inflammation in their bloodstream, okay? So, um, uh, you know, CRP and these other markers of how inflamed is your body, right? So they drew the baseline and then they had an actor come in and pretend to be their boss, right? And for five or 10 minutes, just berated them. Like, wow, you're a terrible employee. How did we ever hire you? Why are you costing us money? You're gonna get fired soon. So just berated them for five or 10 minutes. And then, you know, cut, cut the scene actor leaves and they drew their blood again and they looked for the markers of inflammation. Well, guess what they saw, right? An increase. So inflammation is basically what's gonna kill all of us, right? Because if you think about what, what is the most damaging thing for the inside of our blood vessels leading to that vascular dementia and probably Alzheimer's too, um, it is inflammation, right? So that's five minutes of pretend stress, raising those markers, right? So what if I'm food insecure? What if I'm housing insecure? What if I'm insecure about my job? What if, what if I have a family member with Alzheimer's? What if I have this miserable chronic stress, right? That is going to lead to problems later on. And I like to, to think of um, a saying I heard once, which is every thought through your head has a physiologic consequence. So how about we have the thoughts going through our head as positive and loving and compassionate to include with ourselves, right? Um, there's a wonderful book, uh, Self-Compassion, and I'm blanking um, sadly on the author's name. There's a K in there. Um, I'm sure somebody's read it. Um, it's called Self-Compassion, uh, professor at UT. It'll come to me in a minute. I'm going to get my neurons firing here. Um, <laughs> but it's a wonderful book about just taking really good care of yourself. Um, and so, oh, Beverly, great question. Stopping denepazil and mamantine in advanced stages? No. Okay, so mamantine, um, I'm not 100% sure about the denepazil, but mamantine is neuroprotective, right? Take it as long as you can. I actually have some of my bipolar patients taking mamantine because mamantine is, or excuse me, bipolar disorder is so hard on the brain right? That I will do anything I can to protect them. I'll even give some people low-dose lithium, right? There's some new data that low-dose lithium, not bipolar-dose lithium, right? But low-dose lithium can be neuroprotective, right? I mean, just fascinating stuff. And then Diana asked a question about plant, pro plant protein smoothies. Yeah, I can't imagine why a plant protein smoothie would not be safe and, and healthy, um, that sort of thing. Um, and then Wayne asked a great question. Would anyone past 65 benefit from a neuropsychiatric neuropsych eval? Does Medicare pay for it? The second part of your question, I would think that they have. it has to be indicated. In other words, we saw this concern. We already saw memory decline. We already saw cognitive decline. That would probably be the trigger for Medicare to pay for it. Um, do I have, um, you know, 
do I think there's a any downside to getting a neuropsychiatric evaluation? Absolutely not, right? Again, if you get a, a baseline, I mean, what's the harm in that, right? Other than the cost. I mean, neuropsychological testing out of pocket, I'm, I'm guessing, um, you can Google this and find good neuropsychologists in San Antonio, but I'm guessing a grand out of pocket, you know, a thousand bucks. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I have, I have some patients who are willing to do that because they really want to get that good. Thank you, Kristen Neff. Um, I knew there was a K in there. Um, but, um, but absolutely, um, there's benefit to, to knowing, Hey, what is my baseline in my sixties? Just in case I get a head injury, right. Or that sort of thing later on. And then taurine, I apologize. I should know more about taurine than I do, but um, but I, I don't think I'm educated enough on it to give you a solid answer. I'm so sorry about that. Anything else before we wrap up? Okay, I'm out of focus here. Well, Jeff, thank you very, very much. We uh, We always enjoy having you. And um, I wanted to mention that we have an addition to this particular Abode Academy 7 series. We've added Thursday, May 16th, Natalie Buster is going to lead a workshop on yoga therapy for brain longevity. So add another Thursday onto your calendar for, for that. She's going to be great as she always is. Uh, Wonderful to see everybody. I think we'll do a survey. I should have done that last week. We always want to track how we're doing. So I'll send out a survey tomorrow morning on Jeff's presentation and also Jenny Funk's presentation and love for you to, to share your thoughts about that. Okay, we'll come see us next week and buy lots of art at Abode. And um, and then go to a, a boathome.org, Abode Academy 7, and you'll see the recording from last week. And we'll get this one up as soon as we can, too. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Mary and Thank Jen. You. Thank you.